continuing on. Here we have another painting that was exhibited in that uh, autumn salon. His portrait of Madame Matisse slash also called The Green Line. And this is a rather interesting title. Let's pause it to dwell on a moment on that. The painting title suggests that it is just as much a painting of his wife as it is a painting about just formal elements. Right? It references the green line that bizarrely divides her face. Is the painting about a person or is it just, is it just about, again, formal elements, paint and color? Right? Um, Here again, we have an emphatic statement that paint, that color can be used as he wishes. Color does not need to be naturalistic. Blue hair, a face that is broken up into two large planes of color, one yellow, one pinkish, with a, again, green stripe down the middle. And notice again, the emphatic flatness of the painting. The background is, you, is, is just divided into broad planes of vivid color, visible with lots of visible brush strokes. And the figure of Madame Matisse is also largely composed of broad planes of color. And it's difficult, really, to read her figure as being in front of these patches. They all kind of look like they exist on the same plane. That basic convention of having a figure feel spatially separated from the background that it rests against is being denied here, right? The, whole, the, the, the figure feels every bit as flat as the background. Here, another important precursor for Matisse is the portraits of Van Gogh. And we could talk about, we, and when, we did, when we talked about Van Gogh, we didn't spend much time on, on his portraiture, but this is, a, a, again, a, a, a rich and important body of Van Gogh's work, much like the Bader's work, a large series for, for Cezanne. Uh, we just didn't have a chance to talk about them, but it's worth bringing these up here. Um, we can see the emphasis on vivid color, on complementary colors, visible brushwork, etc. One of Matisse's uh, breakthrough periods following this trip to Collioure that he begins working on just after this initial Fauvist exhibition at the Autumn Salon. Uh, here is his Bonheur de Vivre, painted in late 1905 into early 1906. Bonheur de Vivre means joy of life. You get the sense that Matisse was emboldened by the success and the, and, and, and the kind of scandal caused by that first Fauvist exhibition. Um, and Matisse is going even more boldly in, in the direction that was, that was uh, prompted by his uh, experiments while in Collioure in Saint-Tropez. The joy of life is much larger than anything he showed in that last exhibition. Um, this is a painting that is almost six feet tall by eight feet wide. A complex, multi-figure composition, again, delving into this uh, genre of the Arcadian scene, the nude body, at harmony in nature, scene of visual pleasure, right, which is even referenced by the title, The Joy of Life. Matisse is looking at all kinds of historical precedents from the, uh, from like prehistoric cave painting which was primarily line drawing, much like these figures that we see are primarily line drawings, filled in with flat planes of color. Also looking at Renaissance art, like uh, the work of the Venetian Renaissance artist Giovanni Bellini in his, in his uh, Feast of the Gods, where we, we again see bodies out in nature, enjoying all kinds of decadent behavior, lounging, drinking, etc. So all these art historical precursors are kind of coming together in Matisse's painting. We should also be reminded of, again, Cezanne's bathers. Let's pop that up. And we 
we see here, notice the way that these trees kind of shape and kind of frame the scene. Similar thing going on here, because we have all these figures being sort of framed by, uh, by nature. One, th one, one way in which Matisse really departs from uh, this type of sub uh, previous treatments of um, figure in nature is that he gives us a complex multi-figure composition, but notice how the figures are kind of spread apart around the painting. They're not brought together in any kind of cohesive, integrated way, but rather they're dispersed. We have all these little visual anecdotes almost, right? Little groups of figures, maybe interacting with one another or in small groups, but not interacting as any kind of total harmony. Or all, you know, they're, they're not, they don't have, like, they're not like, like this, for example, where all the figures are very clearly linked and bound together through gestures and interlocking poses. That's not at all what's happening. Here, <clears throat> Matisse's wild, undisciplined use of color is even more aggressive, right? Color doesn't even really stay inside the lines. We have bald patches of color without any kind of contour line. We have figures that seemingly change colors, like this figure here that sort of dips into a weird greenish color. Um, figures are casting multiple shadows, right? These, like, notice how this, these figures here have like this, like, both a green and a red aura. Complementary colors, incidentally. The landscape is this complex swirl of colors, yellows and purples and blues and reds. Um, <clears throat> we have this band of perhaps water that unexpectedly turns into purple. And much more than anything we saw before, there's a real emphasis on drawing. Each figure is defined by a very elegant contour line and minimal interior definition, right? Just a few lines to articulate breasts or genitals, etc. While the figures are incredibly reduced, notice the, the complexity of the drawing. I mean, I would try, encourage you to try to draw this figure, for example, in your notebook without lifting your pen, just how, how, have, have a body being completely defined by one contour line, that perhaps that encloses the entire figure. Matisse, for all his gifts with color, is also an exceptional draftsman. Here, this painting was uh, really kind of broke the mold when it came to uh, earlier generations of avant-garde. For example, like. Paul Signac, who was previously a fan of Matisse's work. Remember, he bought that earlier work, Yves Calme et Bulette. This painting earns Signac's ire. He says, quote, up until now, I have valued Matisse, but he seems to have taken the wrong direction. Referring to this work, he says, across a painting two and a half meters broad, he has framed his odd figures in lines, the thickness of your thumb. Then he has smothered the lot in lackluster, clearly marked off colors, which may well be pure, but are still revolting. Matisse has totally given up on any kind of optical mixture. He's not interested in defining figures just with color, but with line also, which was, something which was antithetical to what Signac was after. Um, this is bold new territory. And if Signac disapproved, it did find a readily uh, available audience and was, was quickly snatched up by a brother and sister, uh, Leo and Gertrude Stein. Gertrude Stein is a very important uh, writer. And she and her brother lived together in Paris uh, where they were avid collectors of avant-garde art. And Gertrude and Leo Stein would purchase works, important early works by Matisse, by Picasso. And this work here assumed pride of place in their living room, which would host a regular salon uh, that is a salon spelled with the, with the lowercase s, not like the big academic salon exhibitions. Lowercase s salons are social gatherings where people come and discuss art and culture and philosophy, etc. Uh, 
and Gertrude and Leo Stein hosted a regular salon that attracted some of the, the real the, the most notable figures in French culture at the time. And so people would come and gather uh, at the, the at the Stein's place to be part of the most hip and sophisticated crowd, and they would see this painting on the wall. So this painting stood as like a marker signifying the advanced taste of the host and hostess. Worth, uh, worth also, also mentioning, I forgot to bring this up before, is uh, another um, art historical precedent. Here we have the work of the late 18th, early 19th century French artist Jean-Auguste Dominique Ancre, his uh, painting of Venus, and we can see uh, him, uh, Matisse, quoting this pose, for example, uh, with this figure here. So just another um, example of Matisse's mindfulness of tradition, even while he's totally blowing it open with, with a work like this. Another factor that was important in Matisse's early work was the influence of African art. Matisse, along with his colleagues Durand and Maurice uh, de Flamenc, who comes in later, were avidly collecting art objects from Africa. And they were also looking at ob objects from Africa um, in ethnographic museums, looking at especially things like these African masks. And uh, Europeans would have had more access to uh, artifacts from African culture because of the growing colonialist presence of, Europe of European countries in Africa. And um, Africa really becomes the new primitivist ideal in the imaginations of Europe. So the Africa, Africa becomes to European artists what Tahiti was for Gauguin, a kind of um, uh, ideal of a you know, pre-modern, uncivilized culture. That's how it exists in their imagination, not in reality, right? But it's important to stress that the way that European artists imagined Africa is very different from the actual lives of African people. Um, but objects like these were very were factored largely in their imagination. We're going to come back to uh, the importance of masks down the road. Come back to this painting here. This is a work called the Blue Nude uh, parentheses Memory of Biskra. You don't see that uh, in the caption here, but Memories of Biskra. Biskra is spelled B I S. K R A, and Biskra was an oasis town in the North African desert. And Matisse took a little vacation to Biskra and produces this painting shortly after returning home. It purely derived from his his memories and imagination in response to this trip. Um, we see a classical subject in a way, right? The reclining female nude but it is given a shocking reinvention. First of all, the non-naturalistic colors. This is the body uh, defined largely through um, shades of blue, right? Blue shadows, blue, you know, blue, blue modeling, blue contour lines. Uh, the body exists in harmony with nature, and, 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 and it's not like, um, uh, uh, necessarily just like a, like a sensual harmony, but rather it meant, it's meant to be a formal harmony. Right? Notice like the echoes, for example, of the, the figure's breasts and hips with the curves uh, of the plants in the background. Notice how everything is also very, very flattened, right? Patch with patches of color um, defining the ground, and the body itself seems awfully flat. Right? Very easy to imagine this body, like, like a cardboard cutout, very little in the way of, of interior shadowing and, and highlight. Even more shocking than that than the use of color is the the anatomy of this figure. The its hips are shifted at a at a almost impossible angle, right? Um, notice how it's almost like a perpendicular uh, angle that, that are, or between the um, pelvis and this leg. I mean, how, how does this figure hold this pose? Also notice the um, kind of androgynous quality of the figure. This the strong musculature, the bulky um, features, the boyish face. 
people even commented that her her hips here and buttock almost look like a phallus, right? I mean, it's it's a very odd image. And so here Matisse is looking at using the 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 African female nude as a kind of alternative to the Western European female nude, an alternative body type, an alternative sexuality, perhaps. That's that's part of what's happening here too. Using images of Africa to reinvent genres that had a long tradition in Western art. Matisse was also at the same time treating the reclining female figure in sculpture. And you get the sense that perhaps he was trying to translate the forms of his sculpture into painting. You get to see, you can see the kind of equivalent between this very blocky um, and upturned hip and the features that we see here. And Matisse is really one of the great painter sculptors. And he's someone who, for whom these two art forms would exist in dialogue. And so this is something else that we'll kind of trace as we follow Matisse's career in the coming weeks. We're going to skip this one and talk about this one in class. And instead shift our attention to... the end of Matisse's Fauve period. And you start to see him uh, nearing a turning point. When we get to this work here, let's actually go to this. This is Matisse's oil sketch call for the painting Le Lux. Uh, this is because it's the preparatory sketch. We call it Le Lux 1, and this is Le Lux 2. This one painted after. The fact that it's called Le Lux, luxury, reminds us of that earlier painting, Lux Calme et Velouté. Actually, sorry, let's go back to that one for a second. This work here, done in a more, what is now, should now be a kind of familiar Fauve style. We see the outline figures of um, the, the, like the, the, the bonheur de vivre, the joy of life. We see the kind of brushy quality of the paint. Um, whereas when we get to something like this, it's, we see some changes, right? The colors aren't quite as shocking. Um, the brushwork isn't as choppy. There's, there's no evidence anymore of Matisse's earlier uh, dabbling with, with, with pointillism or neo-impressionism as Signac called it. Um, the contour lines are very crisply defined and, and the colors sort of are, are bound to those contour lines. Uh, and so we see Matisse kind of turning a corner here in, in some interesting ways. Um, A sign that he's kind of leaving his phobism behind and, and, and growing increasingly confident in his artistic, in the means at his disposal uh, for creating art. This is a very, this one here is a very large work, it's nearly seven feet tall. So we can count these figures at life size. Um, there is a complete disregard for perspective, right? You get the sense this figure is coming in from the background, but the, the colors are so flatly applied, there's nothing that guides her eye uh, deep into space. Um, the figures are resolutely flat, right? I mean, each one can easily be imagined as a cardboard cutout. Each one has a clearly defined contour line, and yet you do get the sense that they exist in space somehow, but it is not the traditional perspectival space. It's a very complicated thing. Um, it's a space that is only created through line and flat color, not through line and shadow. Not, I'm sorry, not through light and shadow. The space is made further complicated by whatever is happening here, where we have this, what looks like a patch of bare canvas, into which this figure seems somehow like she's like tucked into it, because she's reaching her arms into the substance of the canvas itself, that which is 
impossible, right? Right, because the canvas is is two dimensional. But I mean, so it, it's it's a spatially bizarre painting. Also complicating the work is that we have no idea who these figures are, which is something that we've seen before, um, but. They have you know, just as much of a sense of anonymity as, as the figures in, in Bonheur de Vivre. And whereas, like, um, going back to Bonheur de Vivre, there, were, there are some elements of, of, of like classicism here, like the figure playing the flute, and the split flute, which is reference to mythology. Here, we have no idea who this figure is. You get the sense that she's important, like a Venus, but she's clearly not Venus because she's being attended to by these subservient figures. But who are they? What exactly is going on? It's difficult to tell. Uh, whoops, let's go back. He was in part inspired by the work of a French muralist named Pouvier de Chavon, who worked in a kind of vaguely classicizing yet somewhat ambiguous style where he had these like classical figures in nature but it's difficult to kind of tell who they were or if they were allegories what exactly they represented so that that kind of ambiguity and classicizing influence uh from Puvi de Chavon was important to Matisse um but you get the sense that Matisse here is embarking on a brand on a, on a wholly new direction one that we will continue to trace uh, as we can talk more about Matisse next class Matisse it's worth pausing for a moment to mention that he introduces us to a new ism, a new theme in uh, modern art, a, a thing that we call expressionism. And Matisse, in his own comments on his work, emphasized this idea of expression. He said at one point, quote, expression for me does not reside in passions glowing in a human face or manifested by a violent movement. The, the entire arrangement of my picture is expressive. The place occupied by my figures, the empty space around them, the proportions, everything has its share. Composition is the art of arranging in a decorative manner the diverse elements at the painter's command to express his feelings. In a picture, every part will be visible and will play its appointed role, whether it be principal or secondary. Everything that is not useful in the picture is, it follows, harmful. A work of art must be harmonious in its entirety. Any superfluous detail would replace some other essential detail in the mind of the spectator. So expression for Matisse isn't about subject matter, right? You don't get the, the gist of a painting by um, seeing mythological figures and you, that, you know, where you know their identity, or you don't get expression through the mood of someone's you know, facial features or their facial expression. Expression for Matisse comes from the entirety of the painting. Every line, every figure, every single element is part of its expression. And anything that doesn't contribute to that expression is superfluous and should be removed. Um, and so for Matisse, it's not problematic that you don't know who this figure is or you don't know why they're interacting in this way. It's not important that you don't know where they are, but rather what's important is the way that all of these figures and the colors that compose them and the lines that compose them, how they all come together to have some kind of impact as, uh, on you as a viewer. Expressionism is about the modification, the distortion, of nature in order to achieve some kind of expressive effect. So expressionism often goes hand in hand with some form of abstraction, reducing figures, manipulating figures, making them seem different than they appear to our eyes um, in the interest of having some kind of creating some kind of, of feeling or sensation in the viewer. In Fauvism and Matisse's uh, other forms of work in the early 20th century, are, is that, that represents our first um, instance of this idea of expressionism. And well, expressionism is an idea that we'll trace uh, in more detail as we go along uh, in coming weeks. It should be noted that expressionism had some connections to uh, symbolism. Both symbolists and expressionists were not interested in giving uh, viewers the world as it appeared to them. They were perfectly willing to deviate 
from naturalism. However, the symbolists were interested in conjuring up some kind of inner world, right? Some kind of world of inside the mind of the artist. Whereas the expressionists are interested in using in, in deviating from, from naturalism to create a feeling in the viewer. So that, like for so example, for example, in this painting here, uh, a feeling of luxury, or in the the bonheur de vivre, the joy of life, a feeling of sensuous pleasure in nature, right? Matisse is interested in creating um, these feelings in the viewer, and so this is part of what expressionism uh, is after. We're going to talk about um, uh, the other Fauve artists, Durant and Blamink, next time. I think that the early work of Matisse is kind of a lot to digest at first, and so I want to make sure that we have a chance to talk about Matisse together as a class on Thursday, or I'm sorry, on Tuesday, before we move ahead. So let's stop here. Um, make sure that you do your, use this time as a chance to catch up on your reading, um, and please bring Matisse's notes from, of a painter uh, to our next class, along with the Brent Cousy reading because I want to make sure that we have time to talk about the Matisse reading as well. So I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Have a nice weekend.